Okay, dear students, we are now live on the Instagram, and today, in our today's discussion, we want to discuss a number of topics about the opportunities to study abroad, about how to choose college, how to prepare for SAT, about admission requirements, how to write motivation letter, personal statement, and so forth. And I would like to introduce two students, Sukrob Morodov, the student of Uzbekistan School, and you are going to graduate the next year, and Bobur. Uh, Bakhtiorov, who is also expecting to graduate the next year. So, after exactly one year, you're uh, both going to be the university student, hopefully. And we want to know your perspective, and our followers also want to know your perspective about studying here and studying in the US. What are the differences between high schools here in Uzbekistan and high schools in the USA? So, uh, let's start. Here is the format about the introduction, and each of you, we would like to hear about you, and please speak louder. Okay. I can speak a little bit lower because I'm sitting close to the camera and the audio equipment, but I expect you to speak a little bit louder. Start, gentlemen, please. We will start with the introduction. Okay, um, so my name is Robert John Maxar. Um, today we're going to be talking about, so we're going to be talking about, um, uh, high school, what we do in high school and how to get into college. So basically about college admission and um, introduce yourself. Yeah. So like we'll be talking about the process of application, the differences in the application in Uzbekistan in, in, in the United States. We'll like discuss these topics and like so that we, we can have clear understanding of the process. Yes, and I'm also a student in Brooklyn, New York, in uh, the United States. So I'm currently in high school, 11th grade, and I'll be graduating next year, um, and I'll be a senior next year. Um, so, um, what do you think about choosing a good university? Like, what do you, how do you think um, people go about choosing university? Okay, I think that the ranking of university is not always important, mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, education is the same everywhere. It, like, depends on, on students. For example, students who apply to Garvard, it's so like top university, they are all smart students who study hard, who have enough knowledge, uh, who have like good mental outlook and so forth. But the students who like get into less prestigious universities have less knowledge. But education in both universities is the same. Maybe Garvard uh, has made more opportunities, like they have their own, for example, uh, robots, cars and so forth. They have more equipment for students to use, like yeah. uh, unlike other universities. But anyway, it depends on the student. Education is the same. That's why when choosing a university, you have to pay attention to the like subject you are going to major in. If you are yeah. going to choose IT, then go for a university which focuses more on, on IT than on the other schools. I agree with you. I think that most people do choose prestigious uh, universities like Harvard just because of the name. They believe that, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, everyone knows it, it's popular, so if I get into it, everyone will be like, oh, good job, you got into Harvard. But the thing is, like you said, the education is the same for every place. The only difference would be that Harvard is more popular. So let's say that in the future when you do graduate a college, let's say I graduate Harvard, you graduate, let's say, Brooklyn uh, College. And then when we go to a job interview, yeah, they might choose me over you because I went to a more prestigious school. But our the things that we know, our knowledge would be pretty much the same thing. So we would have equal knowledge on every topic. On we have the same major, of course. And I think that you should choose a university that fits you. It doesn't have to be prestigious. It doesn't have to be big. As long as it meets your requirements and you're able to express yourself there and you're able to to just do the work there, I think that you should be able to go to any university you wish, as long as they offer the faculty or the thing that you're trying to do in that university. Yeah. Yeah. And let's talk about the preparation for the SAT. You know, uh, you know better than me, uh, like 90% of all American universities require SAT from both national students and international students. Because it's like an exam which proves your reasoning skills. You know, SAT is more about critical thinking, reasoning. That's why it's called like reasoning tests. And there are also subject tests uh, which focus on subjects. And, uh, how do you think? What are the most effective preparation strategies for the SAT? First of all, I want to mention that SAT is a standardized test. So the reason that they made SAT is because education system in the United States, for example, is different. Very, it varies by state. So in each state, it's different. So like if you were to go to Alabama, they would have a different education system than if you were to go to New York. So they made this uh, test, the SAT test, for everyone throughout the world, the same exact test to test their knowledge on basic things. 
So like the exams everywhere vary. For example, you guys have exams here end of the year. I have exams in New York. They all vary, but they made the standardized exam just so like they could test everyone's knowledge on the topic and it's the same test. So it's not harder for some people. It's not easy for everybody. It's the same test, graded same throughout. And I think that um, preparing for the SAT, yeah, um, like you said, the, the subject test, there's the SAT, but just to study in general, I think that you have to work on your language, for example, for the English section, English and math section, they're both two different uh, different tests. So for the English section, um, like um, Mr. Muhammad said, uh, you have to work on your language proficiency. So it, it's not really strategies. You can't really, uh, like the third party, like Princeton Review or other reviews, you can't really read those, be like, uh, learn about how to work on a question. If you improve your language and your proficiency, so if you're able to comprehend the reading more, I think you'll be doing good on the English section. But the math section is more self-explanatory, like you just need to know formulas. Math, it's not hard. Math it has one answer, one concrete answer. You can't have more than one answer on the math section. So as long as you know your formulas, as long as you know how to do math, you'll be fine on the math section of the SAT. Um, and if you remember, we had a disagreement about the like resources to use for the SAT. Yeah. You say that Princeton Review, Mark Rothschild are all the same and you do not have to believe the bloggers mm -hmm. on YouTube who state that you have to use only authentic resources published yeah. by College Fund or Khan Academy or College World. So uh, do you think like there is big difference between the resources third party publishers like you use and the real exam? The thing is third party, they're more, they're more based on statistics and data. So like those Princeton reviews, they would make those questions based on the, the survey they get, the statistics they get, and they try to, they give you a practice test and they explain you the answer. Th that, that's only for practice. Like the, the similarity between that and for example Khan Academy is they're both places where you go, you take practice tests and it explains you what, why a question is right or wrong. But, and then like, but it, in order to practice for the SAT, that doesn't really help you. You have to know the topic, you have to know the language in order to achieve. And like you said, the YouTube videos, I don't really like the YouTube videos because every single YouTube video you go to, they, they tell you to do a different thing. So for example, if one video tells you, oh, um, you have to work on questions, like you have to know how, how to solve a question and explain you why the question is right or wrong, that might be, that might not be the case. And um, so, and, and then, uh, but you have to know the language. That's not, you cannot work on a certain question. Like you have to have the knowledge. Like, you, the, you, you cannot learn, you cannot get knowledge just based on um, like the reading why the correct yeah. answer is correct. But you know, I think that the resources you choose to use are also important because yeah. if you look at Princeton Review, you read the strategies for handling the reading section. Mm -hmm. If you notice, they're all taken from the IELTS. You have yeah. to skim the passage, you have to find the keywords, answer the question. It's too technical for the SAT. It's more about comprehension than about the techniques. Uh, but if you read the books written by private tutors, such as Erika Meltzer, like critical reader, you can see good strategies which mm -hmm. like improve your comprehension, focus, and makes the, the tasks uh, like significantly easier. Or else, if we look at College Panda, they include all, all only question types which you encounter on the SAT, not like uh, needless stuff mm -hmm. like put on Princeton Review, other resources. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree that. It's important to work yeah. on language, like you, like you said. So, yeah. so SAT is important. So like, if you are preparing for the SAT, I think the English section is where you have to work on your language. You, you cannot improve the, your score on the English section yes, yes. by looking at the questions on the English section. You have to work on yourself and your language proficiency in order to better on the section. Yeah. Well, math is the same throughout. Like, it's a standardized exam. So like, you do the math, it's just formulas. You just memorizing formulas and not just knowing math in general. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to ask you something, you already took SAT, PSAT and so and how much time did you devote in one day to preparation, three or four hours? So for the PSAT, um, I actually started uh, preparing from freshman year of high school, so ninth, after ninth grade in the summer, I started my PSAT preparation from there. And since I had a lot of time until the March of sophomore year, the 10th grade, I had a lot of time. So I would do every day, little by little, like an hour two hours, sometimes I would skip a day, but then when it got close to the exam, I would, I would I would cram for the exam, like so every day for like three, four hours each. So that's why I did really good on the PSAT because I got a 14, 40 out of 15, 20, which was a high one percentile. But for the SAT, I had so much other work, like other classes, so I couldn't really prepare that early for, for the SAT. So I only studied 
the two weeks before the test, I started my I started my studying two weeks before the actual test. So I did not do as well as I thought I would do. So I I would advise you to study from early on, at least five to six months before I would advise you to start your studying and just continue like hour or two a day. And then when it's close to the exam, just do more if possible. Yeah. I see. And uh, you like did some practice tests from Khan Academy, you took some full yes. tests, right? Yes. Do they reflect the real test? Or? Yes, they do. They do. They, they reflect. Do. They, 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 they are not reflect. easier. No, they're not easier or harder. They are. Uh, practice that they have been given before so as long as you have not been exposed to that and they give you time too like the time is strict they, they, there's a countdown of the time and it's it's the, it's really pretty much the same thing the only way you would do better is if you there's no pressure it's not the real thing so you you know you're not nervous yeah, that's why you yeah you're not nervous job. you have time you're like oh even if i do bad right now it doesn't really affect anything i do in the future so you do it and you get a better score but on the real sat you you're more worried about your score you'd be like what if i don't do this right and then you have more pressure on you that's why you might do lower yeah you but like on, stress it yes it hinders your focus yeah. concentration yeah so but on the long run it's the same thing the both practices the yeah. practice tests, they give you the same score and it's the same thing uh so the and it's really important also that people really want to go to university. They'd be like, oh, this is a prestigious university, I'll go to that, but without thinking their faculty, what they want to do in the future. So I think that it's really important that people first choose what they have, to, that they want to do, what faculty or what's the major that they're going to major in university or college before going to it. So like, for example, if they're trying to go to a big university, they, they do offer everything. But um, it's really important that they first know what they want to do in the future. They know their major and then pick their college or university based on their interests, not just, oh, this is a prestigious college or university, I'm going to it. And then when you go there and they don't offer what you want to study, then you'll have um, problems later. Yeah, and how do you think, what, like, what are the best ways to find your interests, to explore your future well, I think that I think that first you should just um, explore your hobbies, like what do you like to do on your free time, like anything. Like for example, myself, I like arguing. From when I was a kid, I always liked arguing. Like if I'm arguing with a friend, I would not like stop until I won an argument. Like I, even if I knew at the point that I was wrong, even if I knew that I would lose the argument, I would just keep continuing until I make the person believe my lies. So then I was like, the closest profession that that comes to this profession is lawyers. Lawyers, they like arguing, no matter what, they argue. So then I would be like, oh, so I wanna do, I wanna be a lawyer, cause that's where my thing fits. So it, it doesn't specifically have to be like, oh, I like playing soccer, I wanna be a soccer player, you can't really say that. So like, yeah. you have to know like different interests, what you like to do, the skills that you have that would match a job one day. So like, you, you could be really good at, let's say numbers, you could work with numbers, you go work in a bank, you do something with finance. Too. So like, it, it, it just depends, just, just explore what you like to do, your hobbies. Just what 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 are you good at that you could do as a as a, a career in the future? Uh, maybe some questions and comments from the audience. Or if you are in like the major in the university, can you repeat that? Or if you are in like the major in your university, can you choose out the same job or just shall we choose another job? You, is a question like, can you choose your? Major. What if you don't like the major in the university? Uh -huh. Yeah, you could change. You could change it. The, the only bad thing is, so let's say that first you choose your major as law, right? You do it for okay. a semester and you don't like it. Now you want to change it. Like you're saying you want to do something else. The only thing is now for the new major that you choose, you have to go a semester longer. So you could change at any time you want. But that means like, for example, if you do one year or something, you don't like it and you change, that means you have four more years of that thing to go again. Cause like it's a new major, so you have to learn about the, the that area. So what if you change it four times? What kind of diploma are you gonna get? Well, the thing is you could change it four times. If you don't complete the course, you're not getting a diploma. So like you could do, oh, one year of law, one year of med, med school, one year of engineering. You're not gonna get any diploma unless you complete the 100, uh, usually it's 120 credit requirement to get your bachelor's degree or associates. So as, as long as you complete the course and you complete the credit um, requirements, you'll be fine. You, you will get your uh, diploma. But I don't advise you doing one year of this, one year of that. First, because you're wasting time and money. Like it's not, it's not your scholarship don't always uh, do that. If you keep on changing majors, they'd be like, no, that's it. Like we cancel our scholarship with you. So I recommend you first think about what you want to do and then just commit to, to that one thing and not change like between majors. Any right. other comments? And you know, 
like uh, choosing your future deal or choosing a title, it should not be like all about interest. You have to think about your future opportunities and perspectives. We can take like IT as an example. It's a growing skill, right? IT is required everywhere in economics, in politics, in all companies and businesses. So you, if you choose IT, you'll be more competitive in the job market in the future. But if you choose social sciences, uh, which is not uh, so popular right now, you are gonna lose. You won't have many career opportunities. That's why I think even if you are interested in something, you also have to take future opportunities and perspectives into account. I somewhat disagree with that. Just because, yeah, you could do IT, you could do whatever that's growing, but if it doesn't interest you in the, in the future, you would regret doing it. Like, for example, I'd rather go to a job where I like it. Like, if I enjoy my job, I, I'd rather do it. And let's say, like, if you don't like your job, yeah, it, it pays well, it's good, it's a good opportunity, you work at a, some great bank or a great place, but if you don't like it, as pers personally, you won't be able to enjoy it. It's not about the money or it's not about the place that you work at. It's about if you like the job and if you enjoy it. So yeah, first in first place, you should uh, go for your interest. You should just explore your interest. But then if you don't have interest and, and you, you don't know anything to do, then you could go with like IT or like just go with something that's uh, that's popular like right now. So for you, like job satisfaction is more important than yes. money. But yes. for me, it's vice versa, you know? Because even if you enjoy your job but don't like get uh, much from it, you can't uh, improve the quality of your life. Cost of living is rising, so respectfully, you have to earn more just in order to meet your daily demands or yeah, the but most basic needs. If you really like the job that you're doing, you always get promotions. Like for example, in the United States, right? Teachers, being teachers, they pay really like low. The, the income is really low. Like for example, you start off with about $40,000 a year, right? That's really low if you're living in America. But as you go on, if you're good at your job, right? If you're good at your job, you get promoted, you get promoted, and it goes up to $200,000 a year, which is like more than average. Oh, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible, even as a teacher. Like, so yeah, you're right. Like, it, it, job satisfactory is not as important if, if it pays low, but if you're good at the job that like you're interested in, it will pay high in the future. So you have to work on whatever your job is. If you work for it, you can get the highest, no matter what the, um, the area of the job that you want to do is. I want to become a teacher now. Two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's you can go up to that. Like, I, I know of teachers that that have done that before. Yeah, so that's why I'm. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Any anything? Sure. Do you have any questions? No, I suppose not. Okay. Um. Let's talk about admission requirements. So, what are colleges looking at? Like, what do colleges want from students like us? So. There are a few things they want. First, they want to see con consistency. They want to see that you kept up your grades, you have a great GPA overall. So like throughout your high school years, you, you need to uh, have the same grade, so your overall GPA is high. So um, the first thing uh, colleges look at is your GPA to see if you actually did your schoolwork before they see your extracurricular or everything else. Second comes extracurriculars. So like, let's say um, he has a hundred GPA, his, his GPA is 4.0, he, he has the best GPA, but he has not done anything else like extracurriculars, while he has a 95 GPA, but he has extracurriculars. They would choose him because he's a more all-rounded person. They could see his personality or what he likes to do in his free time, while he, they were like, oh, he's a robot, he just does his schoolwork, he just gets good grades, that's it. While if you have extracurriculars, if you show, for example, you're in a club or you're in a sports team, they see that you're an all-rounded person. You're not only like good in one thing, but you could, uh, you're could you multitasking and you're able to like uh, complete more than one thing at a time. Um, also, the SAT, that's really important for college admissions. Uh, and the thing is, uh, you cannot have uh, high in one and then low in others. If you have a well-balanced um, application, you have a decent score, decent extracurriculars, then the colleges would accept you. So like, when you're doing college application, uh, you have to be like all-rounded. And also, lastly, the, if you wanna go to a prestigious school like Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, any of those uh, specific universities, you need to have a unique trait. You need to have a leadership skill. So like whatever you're doing, you need to be leader. For example, let's say um, you're on a team, you have to be the captain of the team. Let's say you're on a club, you have to be the president or the, the creator or the founder of the club. So if you show that you are some type, that you, you have some type of um, leadership skill, then they would accept you because of that one unique trait that you have that they're looking for, like a leadership skill. Yeah, in Uzbekistan, the C 
system is quite different. Uh, like principles here don't look at personal qualities. They like focus too much on knowledge. So before like getting accepted to the university, students uh, pass their exams, take tests on three or four subjects, and the most competitive ones who score the highest get accepted. And two or three of them uh, are awarded scholarships. Uh, they like do not look at personal qualities. They do not look even at GPA. Just the test scores decide everything. With respect to those Uzbekistan education system, I don't like that system. Yeah. It's just I just don't like it. I don't think that you should be uh, your college or university should be determined on that one test that you took. Maybe you were sick on that day. Maybe you didn't do well on tests. Maybe you're not a good test taker, but you're all around and you're a better student. Let's say he scores a hundred on a test, but you scored an eighty that day. That doesn't mean he's more he's more intelligent than you or that he's smarter than you. It just means he's a better test taker than you. So I think that uh, the universities in the United States are better at this type of stuff, like college admission, yeah. because they, they look at everything. They, they're not like, oh, he did, uh, even if you, let's say, uh, I get a thousand on my SAT. It's not good, like it's below average. I, I do below on my SAT, but they see that I have other things, everything great, they're gonna accept me even if it's Yale. Because I have a friend right now who is a senior who got into Yale University, full scholarship, full four year scholarship. She did not even take the SAT. The reason she got in was because of all the other things she did, like extracurricular, everything else, and she got in even without taking the SAT. Without so taking without SAT. taking SAT, so it, it is important, like all aspects. You should take all aspects into consideration while applying to college. Right, okay. Any yeah. questions? Yeah. You said that uh, students should be like leader of some courses, and you should, uh, they should do some courses. Is it the same for the international students? Yeah, I think no matter where you are, like you, you should have some like leadership skills. Like, um, even if you're an international student, there you're not the only international student applying to a certain college. So out of all that international students, what makes you stand out to the colleges? What are you doing that like that they could see that's unique and that's standing out? So if you do have leadership skill, that's just a plus on your uh, college resume. Like so, the, the top colleges, not the, the like the low colleges, they don't really care about your leadership skills, but when, you, when it's a high prestigious schools, they want to see that you are some, like you are top of your class, like you, you are better than everyone else around you. What makes you different than like the 30, 30 students in your class? Like are you a leader? Or what are you doing that, 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 that you, they can compare you to other students? So it's better to have it than not have it. Yeah, I got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. About uh, admission. Any other questions on the mission department? Uh, I want to ask a question about motivation of lecture or... No, we'll uh -huh. be discussing it. Yeah. It's the next topic. Yeah, it's the next topic. Uh, so the, the motivational letter, the personal resume, they're all, um, they're all letters that you're writing to colleges to show who you are. Like, how are you unique? Like, what are you doing? Um, so like, for example, uh, if you were to, to go to a, a, any university, they would ask for your personal statement, like um, like your uh, essay, just describing who you are. Sometimes there would be a prompt, sometimes they'd be like, write about whatever you want, right? So when you're writing those motivational letter or just personal essays, just remember you're writing about yourself. Don't try to be like, uh, don't try to show off uh, like your achievements. That, that's the most important thing. Most students, uh, when they're writing an application, they say, oh, I was part of this organization, I was a leader of this on their essay. No, you already put that on your portfolio. So when you're writing your essay, try to be humble, try to just talk about yourself, just who you are as a person, what you like to do, and what makes you stand out as a student. That, that's the most important thing while writing a, uh, any type of essay for a college. Yeah. So you understand the system better than me? Uh, you already told about motivational letter and personal statement, but uh, when you, for example, like apply to college by, by using common application, mm -hmm. you have prompts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on different topics. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think that if you make up a story, they can uh, simply like, get to know that you made it up? Well, okay, so you have to be descriptive. Like they would, they would know, the, most of the time, they would know the difference between a fake story and a real story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true, they don't ask you for verification. They don't say, oh, verify this, verify that. They don't say that. 
but they do know it like when when you have experienced it you have more detail you put more emotion into your letter while if you make it up you kind of like if there's flaws in what you yeah. in what, you, what you say it's, it's not, not perfect yeah. yeah it's not it's not consistent it's not perfect so they would know and also for the most part uh if you are accepted to college sometimes they require an interview and when you do have an interview and they ask about your essay and it's a lie you are gonna have flaws and then they're gonna know that that you, that you didn't do all those things that you, you did and it's really specifically designed for this yeah for yeah, to yeah to verify to, to yeah. yeah to verify and to just to know that if you did the things that you said in your uh, college portfolio uh, yeah, I see. Um, any questions on the motivation letter or the personal essay um, by the way and uh, we recently had a presentation mm -hmm. from like the I don't know Russell. Yeah, that is, that is Russell. Mm -hmm. And she told that when writing a motivational letter or a personal statement, you have to focus on content. For example, if you're writing about photography, which is your hobby, you have to include more words, more like content related to photography. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think like it's important? Okay, um, so there's two types of essay. Like if, if it tells you to, to write about whatever and like you want to write about photography, I think that you shouldn't really focus too much on the wording, not too much on like the photography word that has to do with photography. It's just how it interests you and how it affects your life. But let's say it's a question that asks you about photography or like a specific hobby that you have, and it's photography, then then you should include all the yeah, just words. To show yeah, that you just to show that you you actually knowledgeable of the topic. But if it's just like an essay that's like write about whatever and you want to write about your interest in photography, you don't have to write like you don't have to show your knowledge on photography, but you have to show how photography affects your life or how it like how you use photography in your everyday life. So there's two instances and you, you write it based on whichever. And also, if it's a specific question, let's say write about photography, write about this, right? And it's specific, try to mind that everyone else is getting the same exact question. Don't try to sound boring, don't try to sound like like for example, if there's 10 people and all 10 have the same idea and they write it, nothing stands out. Try to think outside of the box and try to be more unique about what you have to write. So try to think outside of the box and not write what everyone else is going to write about, like the obvious things. Yeah. Okay. High school in the United States and in Uzbekistan. So you could talk about, you could start talking about the high school in Uzbekistan and how they get you ready for college or university. Okay, go ahead. Talk about uh, Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan? Yes. No, okay, about. so you study for 11 years, and before finishing, before graduating from school, uh, you do some extracurricular classes just to prepare for your university exams. That actually starts in 10th or in the beginning of the 11th grade. Uh, and it actually depends on the field you are gonna specialize in. If you are going to take up the laws, then you have to study history. Uh, history, law, and some related subjects outside of your of the of the classroom. Like uh, you go to school, uh, you take some extra curricular classes, and you focus more on them than on the school lessons. Uh, then you go to the university to take the exam. Uh, you take the exam, and your results are released within fourteen or fifteen days. And it totally depends on your exam exactly. score, on your exactly. notes. Yes. Yep. They don't even look at your GPA, your school marks, and so forth. I think uh, the process is actually a bit flawed. It's not uh, like solid, you know? They, they can't uh, accept all students because some of them might use uh, their phones or other resources just to, to help themselves out, or they might be cheating and so forth. I think the system is not so reliable. Yeah, I agree. And I just want to compare one thing. Like in here, for first grade to 11th grade, it's kind of the same school. You go to the same school. But in America, it's different. So for example, from like kindergarten to fifth grade, you're in one school. And in those five years, they prepare you to get into a good middle school, which is from sixth grade to eighth grade. And then once you get into a good middle school, then they prepare you to get into a good high school. So like every, every like uh, school that you graduate, you try to get into a better one. So that system of taking tests and being a, having a unique trait, it's built into the children from when they're a kid. So like for example, uh, when I arrived in the United States, I was fifth grade. And I, that year I had to apply for a sixth grade. I didn't have anything to apply to, so I didn't get into a good middle school because I didn't have um I didn't have any like I didn't have good English. I didn't have any resume. I didn't have anything to show them that I was a good student to get into sixth grade. 
So I just went to a, a, a normal um, middle school, and I had to build up. Uh, I had to build up my resume to like to get into a good high school. I had to have good uh, state exam scores. I had to have a good average, like school average, and then got into high school. And once you get into high school, ninth grade, that's when college preparation starts. In ninth grade, in most high schools in America, you get this class, um, it's an advisory class. So it basically talks about college and how you need to start building your portfolio starting ninth grade. So in ninth grade, you would join clubs, you would start working on your GPA, better yeah. grade in general. And that the, the system that you said, how Uzbekistan system is flawed by taking one exam, that's the, that's the exact system that they try to avoid when you come into high school. They make you believe, like they, they persuade you that uh, you could do anything you want. Just, just go with your interests, go to clubs, do your schoolwork, and you'll be fine. While in Uzbekistan, even if you, are, you have the highest grade in your class, even if you are the best, if you cannot take that one exam, it doesn't matter what you did in the 11 years. It wouldn't matter. But in the United States, it matters. Those four years, the ninth, ninth to 12th grade, really determines what college or university you get into. And you know, you know what? We don't have terms like freshman, sophomore, senior. But yeah. in the in, in United States, you have such terms, right? Yeah. Freshman is a person who came to school freshman for the first is ninth time. Freshman grade, yeah. Ninth grade. Then you have sophomore, sophomore about 10th, 10th grade. grade. Senior, 11th and 12th No, senior is 12th grade and, 12th. and junior, junior is 11th grade. Ah, I see. Yeah, so, we, don't, yeah. we don't have such terms. We only have the primary school. Uh, like which is for the first and fourth grades uh -huh. and high school which is from uh, like for fifth and eleventh grades. Uh -huh. so yeah, yeah, that term is used uh, and the the term um, freshman those are all used in college and high school mostly. But senior is used for any graduating class. If you're a graduating class, if you're a fifth grade, eighth grade, you're considered a senior. So if you're a graduating class, then you're you're just called seniors. But that term, the freshman, summer, they're all really popular uh, in high school and college. They use Throughout. Uh, I see. Okay. Uh, any questions on anything that was said about? Importantly, in Uzbekistan, after graduating the ninth grade, you got a choice whether to go to high school or or to study in a college. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Why? Like some people are not in good good in subjects, so they do want to do other ex extracurricular stuff or maybe sport. They go to the sports college and they do better on sport. And therefore, I think it's not really important to have high school for some people. In this case yeah I agree with you it, it, yeah it is important high school like high school is not that important no matter if you go to uh, a high school or um, like if you stay in your school or go to another prestigious school like for uh, 10th and 11th grade because at the end of the day if you're applying for a university in Uzbekistan the only thing that determines if you're getting in or not is that one exam so no matter if you go to the high school or you stay within your school as long as you prepare for that exam and you could um, and you have enough knowledge to pass that exam, it does not really matter what college, or I mean, what uh, like where you go to or where you study. As long as you know how to pass that exam, you'll be fine no matter where you go. And how many subjects do you study at school? Well, um, I, right now, I'm studying eight subjects. So like it's eight per year. And the one interesting thing in the um, United States is no matter if you're a kindergarten or no matter if you're like in, let's say eighth, ninth grade, you start at the same time, you end at the same time. Like, for example, in here, the uh, the younger you are, the less classes you have, and it, it builds up and you get more classes as you go up. It's not the same. You go to the school at the same time and you get out at the same time no matter what grade you are in. So like, there's more concentration on like study in the United States than I think in here. Yeah, sadly. Here in Jackson, we are to take about 18 classes. So 18, no matter, yeah. Like, yeah. I just I also want to discuss that like you know how in here for example let's say let's say geometry as an example right you start taking it from seventh grade and you take it all the way to eleventh grade right for four years same thing with physics let's say let let same thing with chemistry all you take for a few years right but in America it's different you take one at a time in one year only so in ninth grade I took algebra one that's it one year that's it I did not take it only ninth grade tenth grade I took trigonometry that's it I never took it again. Right now, I'm taking geometry. For example, uh, people in Uzbekistan, you guys start from geometry from seventh grade, and you guys learn all the way to eleventh. But me, I have never taken a geometry class before, and this is my first year, and I'll only do it for one year, and I'll move on. Same thing with science classes. Like I did chemistry in tenth grade, biology in ninth grade, and it's only one year interval. While in here, they spread out the weeks, so like you'll have it once a week but you do it for four, four or five years. But in there, you do it every day, but you just do it for a year. That's that's like a main important like distinction. It's been a great stuff to help up. 
uh, there is a statistic showing up like uh, you're gonna forget about your geometry stuff or algebra you took maybe three years ago because yeah. you have completed it entirely. I'm not really sure about the quality, however, but I believe that some part of the knowledge you will forget in the future. But in effect, that if you take it every single year, you're gonna repeat it or you're gonna do something better on it. So literally, you will be a genius at that field if you are really interested in that field. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just a matter of who learns how, like what fits your learning situation. So for example, me, I want to take it like one year at a time. I can't learn 20 things at the same time. Like I got to take everything one at a time. You master one thing, you move on. So like, yeah, some people do, like you said, like if, it, if you take it for four or five years, you're master at it, like you become like you're so good at it. But it just depends on how you learn. It's just personal um, preference. Any questions? I do have a question about mm -hmm. your school. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. after the lockdown, what kind of changes have happened there? Like uh, you mean after the pandemic? The yeah, pandemic. After the pandemic. Um, so pa pandemic started March thirteenth of two thousand twenty last year, and after that it has been online. Like everything has been online, so we have Zoom meetings. So it's like it's the same thing as school. So I would wake up in the morning at eight. I open my computer. My Zoom meeting starts, and basically Zoom meeting is a video call with your teachers. You turn on your camera. Uh, you have a, if you have to talk, you, t you turn on your microphone and you talk and you your teacher basically sees you, you see the teacher, they keep on teaching their lesson and it's like you're sitting at school but you're just home. So it's online schooling but starting September, uh, it kept on going to uh, blended. Blended is basically if you want to go to school, you go to school. If you want to go remote, you go remote. So like you choose which one you want to do based on your parents. So some people prefer to go to school, some prefer didn't but sometimes there would be like one or two COVID cases in school and they would close it for two weeks open it again close it open so like now it's open but um, you still have the choice of going online or not so that's that's how it's been going in the United States right now well I've heard that some universities are also running online courses right? yeah yeah most so of them. do you think the quality of education is the same like online and offline stuff it depends on it, it depends on the person well the education system, yeah, it's the same thing. As long as, even if you have online, as long as you listen and and you, you retain information, you're fine. The only thing that I think we like we miss or we don't get is social skills. We can't like talk like this right now. So if you have Zoom meetings, yeah, you go in, you, you learn your stuff, you go out, but you cannot socialize with your friends. You cannot talk, you cannot have conversations. So you, your social skills are not advancing. So like uh, for public speaking, let's say, Four years in a row with somebody who comes to high school in ninth grade until 12th grade they're online and when they go to college they're not gonna have any social skills they're not gonna have friends they're not gonna be able to like talk with their talk with any stranger so I think that it's the only thing that we're really missing with online school is just social skills it's just talking with your friends or just socializing in general I have a question uh, even we study in high school we have not opportunity to choose the subject that help us to in the, uh, to help us in the future is it possible to choose a subject uh, discipline that is uh, beneficial for you in the future in the U United States of America? In high school? Yeah. Like you mean if you could choose what subjects you want to study in high school, is that yeah, what you're yeah, saying? Yeah. Well, you have a requirements. Like there are requirements. Like for example, math, social studies, science, and English, you have to take it for four years. Or those are mandatory courses uh, and you have to take it for four years. But other than that, you could go into different faculties or different houses. Like for example, in my school, there's like IT house, there's law house, there's math house, there's finance. So like and when you go into those classes, you have every class same as everyone else, but there's just only that one class that you have that's different and that just focuses on uh, what you want to do in the future. So like I have law, I have, I have had law since freshman year and I have an extra law class like every semester just because I'm, I'm in the law house. So like, and it, yeah, it would change. Like for example, I had mock trial, moot court, those are classes, constitutional law, civil law, criminal justice. So it would change, but the idea is the same thing. You have an extra class on whatever you want to study in the future. Future recommendations. So we are running out of time. Let's join them together in one topic. Teacher, teaching recommendation, teaching advices and recommendations, and AP. Uh, let's start with AP. AP courses, yeah, AP courses are important because um, AP courses are basically college courses that you take in high school, and if you basically get college credits only if you pass the uh, AP exam with certain scores. 
And if you pass it, the, then those are college credits for you in the future. Not all colleges accept it, but they're important. And one thing that you should take into consideration is even if you, let's say, failed the AP course, right? But you took the AP course, you put that on your college uh, portfolio, and the college sees that you challenged yourself. You took a you, you took an extra step and you took an AP course, even though it was hard. You took it, you completed it. Like you're you're basically taking college course in high school that shows that colleges that you're ready. So like for example, let's say Harvard consideration. Harvard won't accept any of your AP courses. Let's say you took ten AP course, you took uh, all the exams and you passed them with five, right? That's the maximum score you could get. They're not gonna accept a single uh, uh, credit, and but. Those college, uh, those AP courses you take are what gets you into the college because they see that, oh, he's a student that challenges himself, he's a student that takes hard classes, that's what they got you in, but you don't get the credit. So it's important to take AP uh, courses. Um, and the teacher recommendation, th that's also really important, teacher recommend, just recommendation in general. And th the reason it's important is because it comes from someone like, someone who's old, someone like your teacher, your guidance counselor, they know who you are. So like when they're writing, they're writing to like, for example, a friend writing to a friend about someone else. So when they, when they write that letter, they talk about your personal qualities, what they saw in you when, you, when, when they had you or like the experience they had with you. So it's really important because they read it, they read it to see teacher perspective on the type of student you are. So I think that it's really important to get a teacher recommendation and as much as you can. Like there's no limit to how many you can have, like it's usually recommended you have two recommendations, but the more you have, the better. Okay, and uh, I wanted to ask something for you. The AP classes you take should be related to your future major, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Because um, let's say you're doing um, law in the future, but there's classes like AP Biology, AP Chemistry. You won't need AP Biology or AP Chemistry if you want to be a lawyer. So there's no point of taking. Yeah, it does help you somehow to get into college, but it's not recommended that you take it. If you take it, um, uh, everything on your area, the, the college sees how determined you are into like that one thing that you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that if you take AP classes related to your future field, you won't have like such big difficulties in the university in the long term because you already are familiar with many concepts. You have enough knowledge in that sphere, and mm -hmm. you won't find new terminologies or new knowledge that you get uh, that difficult. Yeah, I agree, it's true. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question about this recommendation. You know that in Pakistan that's really difficult to get the recommendation letter from ordinary school teachers because they don't really know English. Is it okay to write it yourself and just put the sign of the teacher? No, that, that, that's not recommended. Well, okay, so when you do recommendations for the most of the time, the teacher has to provide their contact information, their phone number and everything, so in case they're called. It's difficult with international students because, like you said, they don't speak English. But yeah, you can make them uh, write in a recommendation letter in Uzbek, have it translated through some type of like organization, like notarial organization, and they, they translate it for you. And you send both copies, the Uzbek and the uh, English, because most universities, the big universities, they have translated. They have uh, people from every country that could translate the recommendation letter, but it's not recommended that you do that. If you forge it and the university finds that out, like forging is basically like uh, writing it yourself and signing it by writing it yourself. And if the universities do know it, there's a lot of consequences. They could write it to the college board and you might not get it, like, uh, admitted to any college in the United States. If they do uh, catch that you're plagiarizing, cheating, or doing anything that you're not supposed to do. Yes, so it's really, it's really, it's really risky, and I don't recommend you do it. <laughs> Anything else? So come on, but at the United States, now there's no more. Any other questions? Okay. So it was a very interesting presentation. I would like to thank both uh, speakers, Sukrov and Bubu, who who provided two different perspectives on similar things. How the a uh, successful Uzbek student and how successful US student sees things. And as you see, the, these are quite different. Yes. When you look things from two different perspectives. Thank you all. Thank you.